fantastic performance. It's um, it's a remarkable for me because especially when I understand that the starting was just so difficult and I, I apologize still for the, so your, your disheartening things that you had to go through. But I'm just so amazed about the, how you can turn around all this project in, in a performance. And then I think that that performance has been recognized by the GFSP. And that's the reason, one of the major reasons why you got another funding for the COVID-19 responses. So I congratulate you and also the project office and all the people who has been working working together with the project office and MAF and the provincial governments and to make this happen. So let's start um, the workshop and about this. Uh, today, uh, we're talking about the RICE SDP, not really the project performance per se, but sort of like an extracurricular act items that we've been working alongside with the RICE SDP. Just to give you a little bit of background why we're doing this, something really weird like this. Um, GFSP requires that the specific data collection for to show the evidence of the project impacts of the, any of the funded project. Now, so, so we were preparing for this because knowing that the project is just gonna close sometime, originally it was gonna close next, sometime next year, but then uh, there was uh, the flood came and there was a COVID lockdown and then on and off, there was a people who were restricted to go to the field or the gathering. Now, we started thinking, wait a minute, if the lockdowns continues on like this, how can we do this inline survey? Is there anything that we can observe from like a, without going into the field discussions? And then we just contacted multiple people and then and started looking at the uh, ELSA practice, a relevant practice elsewhere. And it's like, ah, this is an interesting way of looking at the use utilize a satellite image, satellite data, and also there are a group of people who's using machine learning technique based on the, the, uh, the survey data. So let's just try out what we can observe without under the lockdown period. And then there's and what we can do in between if there's a, like a, there's a lockdown, uh, there's a brief moment when we in between the lockdowns, if we can do something to prepare for the lockdown. So that's a major sort of uh, the motivation we have. And um, the, the multiple of the, the experts just that did a lot of work, interesting work to, for us, so that the, um, your Excellency Silver, that we, we're just going to hear from the, uh, the uh, experts and uh, one by one about the, what they have done and what they have said, uh, uh, what the results are. And then, then we will like to propose a discussion about what we could make use of and what we cannot do and then discussion and so on. So with that, um, can we invite you to open the, the workshop, please? Your Excellency Silva, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michiko. I thank for opportunity to engage uh, in this uh, workshop. So my great pleasure to deliver a quick uh, remark for the opening. Uh, first, allow me to extend my uh, uh, great uh, greeting to all, to, uh, to you, uh, Michiko, uh, Principal Natural Resource and Agriculture Economist, uh, 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 from the ADB, uh, Mr. Leonard, uh, Natural Resource uh, Agriculture Economist, uh, ADB, Mr. Chandu, Senior Project Officer, uh, ADB CAM, uh, the representation uh, sent from uh, all the land ministry uh, participating in this uh, project. Uh, and all the resource person, uh, consultant working with us on this uh, excellency, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so uh, today uh, uh, we, we have uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, calm, uh, the discussion come uh, dissemination workshop on the result of the rice crop here estimation in rice STP target area based on the crop yield survey, satellite image, machine learning technique. The task was uh, carried out jointly by the RISE SDP project stakeholder expert uh, hired by the ADB, particularly for the GIS application. In January, February this year, uh, MAF and IO conducted a crop year so survey uh, through household interview of uh, individual farmer beneficiary and key informant interview of agriculture 
through cooperative and input supplier. The objective uh, actually was to assess whether uh, we achieve our project target related to rice seed use, uh, reduction in post harvest losses, uh, technical advice provided by input supplier to farmer, and land leveling of party field. MAF uh, and IO also con collected the rice uh, uh, crop yield uh, achieved by the project beneficiary. A report was uh, prepared reflecting the crop yield the way. So at this time, uh, you, uh, Miss, uh, Miss uh, Mexico, uh, proposed uh, that we should test the use of satellite image and machine learning for estimating the crop yield, which may be useful during the COVID-19 uh, like situation. When field visit uh, for data collection are uh, uh, sever severely uh, restricted. So she uh, supported the uh, deployment of experts uh, who work uh, with the project stakeholder. These experts are soon going to present their work to us. Moram and IO and PIO participated in this task and provided uh, geospatial data related to uh, irrigation uh, sub project and laser uh, land leveling plots, respectively. So I believe this is a useful workshop uh, uh, and uh, uh, reflecting our partnership for a good purpose. Uh, that is uh, to disseminate the achievement of the RISE EDP project, showing uh, your uh, achievement through GIS mapping that would uh, attract attention of uh, audience uh, and minimize the perceived uh, biasness of data. I would like also to uh, take this opportunity to acknowledge the contribution by stakeholders uh, Mark and I go who conducted the crop yield survey along with the PMO and ADB experts support Mark and I go in finalizing the result of the survey. Um, uh, the contribution by Moram and I go, uh, ADB expert and his team work on uh, work uh, closely with the Mark and I go, the QED organization. Uh, uh, who was uh, hired by ADB to, to draw all the individual rice plot uh, boundary for the project command area. And uh, last but not least, the contribution by the think, thinking machine who worked on artificial uh, intelligence uh, and machine learning. So very new to me, so I uh, look forward to hear from uh, this uh, think tech, uh, thinking uh, machine. So uh, uh, last, uh, I, I just uh, want to thank uh, Michiko uh, personally and thank uh, Gulf and ADB for uh, your contribution to the success of uh, the, the project. So it's not me, but uh, you all, uh, stakeholder, and also the, the staff of the, the project team, and a project, uh, the BMO, the NIO, and BIO, who work hard to contribute to this. And so I thank all of them for turning around of the project. So I hope that uh, this project not uh, success, uh, not count by its output, but uh, maybe the, the uh, footprint, uh, the, the, the legacy uh, would be more important because uh, the idea of the project is uh, innovation, uh, uh, inclusiveness, uh, uh, especially the institutional coordination uh, are very important. So I hope uh, <clears throat> the way we work together uh, and uh, the, the uh, approach, uh, the uh, risk uh, involved in uh, the, the cross-cutting uh, issue uh, that the uh, came through, uh, we uh, went through, uh, would be important for us to maybe to uh, 
uh, implement uh, more uh, 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 productive uh, project in the, the future. Hope that this uh, would make a long lasting impact on uh, social economic uh, development of Cambodia. So with this, I thank you. Uh, thank all the participants in this workshop and hope that uh, everything going uh, smoothly and uh, uh, have a good uh, result of the workshop. So I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Back to you, uh, Michiko. Thank you so much, uh, the, the Excellency Silva, um, for the very warm welcoming words and also i i also i can't agree more with you about the importance of inter institutional coordination and then in that setting we can do something really innovative things to address that sort of like a inter sort of linkages of the across the sector for the social economic impacts i i, I it's a really important point so let's just uh, move on to the presentation we have the first three experts presentation let's start with the the crop survey background and then the summary of the result uh, that I, I believe that edward will present edward you want to come in Okay, let's go. One moment. I, okay. I, Are you sharing the screen? Yeah, I will. I will about. To. Okay. And uh, while we yeah. wait, if that, that during the presentation, if you have the specific questions for the any of the presentation, please type in, in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that, and there will be a, some like a Q and A discussion uh, that that we can uh, the, we can have after the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Now I see your presentation, uh, Edward. Go ahead. Um, I think uh, uh, Biranci will. Uh, uh, okay, so you start. Biranci, do you want to come in first? No, no, maybe I think Edward, go ahead, please. Ah, yeah. Okay. Because we yeah. already discussed about it. Okay, then. So, uh, Excellency, uh, uh, um, and all my. Uh, the other presenters, uh, good morning. So we are going to share with you the outcome of the, uh, uh, the result of the uh, crop survey. So um, basically the topic of the presentation uh, covers about the, um, about some, I will touch about uh, the cooperatives, I mean the paddy rice and rice seed production and trading, uh, a bit about the land leveling, the, the important points about the commercial seeds, the use of the fertilizer farm inputs, and then the uh, practices on weeds and pest and disease control, and then uh, post harvest operation management. So, uh, yeah, we, we have here this will be is to, to look at the status or the, the progress of the uh, project, this uh, will be the, uh, uh, the baseline and it's the, the target. So in the, we are going to gauge actually, uh, we'll try to investigate actually four major, <clears throat> major indicators, uh, uh, which is about the, the use of the commercial seeds uh, by the farmers. Uh, we have it there actually the, the uh, target. Uh, we'll see whether the, the project met the target and then also looking at the reduction of the, of the post harvest losses and also the, um, the, Farmers who are taking uh, technical advice, no, from the input suppliers, and also the uh, farmers who adopted the uh, uh, land leveling, no, in particular the modern land leveling. So the study, uh, the survey covers about in the, uh, I mean, the three provinces, Obatambang, Kapong, Tom, and Preuwing, and then we have <clears throat> basically three groups of respondents: the individual farmers, the cooperatives, and also the input suppliers. So uh, just to pick up some of the few points about the agriculture cooperative. So um, the study uh, uh, revealed that uh, most of the agriculture cooperatives are involved also in the trading of paddy uh, rice and then also selling of seeds and agricultural inputs. So uh, looking at the composition of cooperatives, uh, uh, almost, uh, almost uh, there is almost an equal number of uh, uh, female and uh, male and female members in the cooperative, but in terms <clears throat> in terms of um, employment, uh, more men are employed in, in in the cooperatives in the ratio of two, two is to one. No? Um, and in, in terms of uh, the officials, mostly these are manned by uh, uh, 
uh, men, no? um, about 93%. So looking at the uh, production of uh, paddy rice and the uh, rice seeds, uh, around 21 point, only, only very, very few, no? the, the, the data indicate that there are very few who engage in the rice seed production. So it has an implication because most of the farmers have difficulty in accessing the commercial seeds. No? That is actually the, the key message uh, that is uh, uh, found in this, uh, in this uh, part. No? And mostly the, the common variety they are producing are Sinfro and uh, Karumdul. So, um, uh, but then surprisingly, uh, you will, the, the, the data indicates that there are many farmers who are already trained, no? trained on, uh, on uh, uh, seed production. But despite of that, the level of, uh, of uh, seed production is still uh, quite low. No? Uh, and then some of the problems in uh, paddy rice production that the farmers reveal is that uh, there's a very high prices of commercial seeds, probably because uh, there are only very few who are uh, seed uh, producers. And then also they have related to that, they had a difficulty also in finding the source of the rice seeds. Um, and also they reported that there, is, there are some varieties that are not suitable to the site. Um, these are also the profile of the, uh, par the, the farmers in terms of land ownership, and then the paddy fields they own, and then the, uh, uh, the farmers who are producing so if you look at the cultivation, uh, most, most of the farmers are producing uh, 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 paddy, uh, paddy rice during the wet uh, season. So in terms of land leveling, um, the, the data shows that there are a lot of, a very high number of farmers who are doing land leveling around 88.4%. So, uh, and then more than half uh, of the respondents uh, revealed that they already attended the uh, laser and modern, modern land labeling method. So for those who have uh, interviewed also, who attended the uh, uh, land labeling, uh, more than half uh, signified that they want to do the laser land labeling voluntarily. So uh, in terms also of the portion of male and female farmers, um, uh, almost the same, no, uh, are willing to do the voluntary uh, laser land labeling. So, uh, because there is, this is only one indicator uh, that the the uh, the those who are do land labeling should should uh, have access the uh, female headed uh, companies, no. Um, sixty four percent of those who do laser land labeling employs the contractors. But out of this 4.1% only of the companies who are doing land leveling are headed by women. So there are some of the constraints why the people do not do land leveling. So one of this is the limited capital uh, because, uh, and then uh, that would become a, an, uh, one of the uh, important constraints because the cost of land leveling according to them is also very expensive. Um, well, all the others are not, are not, uh, are, not are minor, but uh, I just pick up about the, the last two. No? Uh, some, there are still, no, despite of the project, uh, some of them uh, pointed out that they, they lack uh, the information about the technology um, uh, that includes the, the uh, benefits and also who are the provider. And then uh, there are only very few uh, service providers in their area. Now let's go to the commercial uh, seeds. No? Uh, so uh, the practice uh, of the farmers is still uh, pre uh, the, the pre broadcasting around 89.2% say that they are using the broadcasting method. But if you are going to look at the, if the, this is very, uh, one thing very interesting because uh, the seeds are very expensive. But then they use the broadcasting method. And uh, you know, in terms of seed usage, there is very high, no? around 150 to 200 kilograms per hectare. But then if you are going to look at the farmers who are using the transplanting method, they only use around 25 to 50 kilograms per hectare of seeds. It's a very, very uh, way below no? uh, in terms of uh, seed usage. Um, but I think it's more on the economics. Uh, the, it will be expeditious, and then maybe the cost of labor also the uh, the farm labor are also very expensive. 
So uh, there are also very high number of uh, uh, respondents who, who adopt the commercial seeds, no? around 74.9%. Um, this is actually way above the target no? of, uh, of the project. So we exceeded the target actually. So the target is only around 70% that uh, the project uh, have uh, uh, most of the farmer beneficiaries uh, reported that uh, around 74.9% of the beneficiaries reported that they adopted the commercial seeds. But then you can just imagine that they are using that one for the broadcasting method. So there are a lot, a, 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 a lot of waste no, of seeds. So um, uh, only a small portion around a quarter no, uh, um, who did not change the seeds. No? And then for those who adopted the seeds, 67.5% or more than half uh, changed the seeds every two years. Now there are constraints in the commercial seeds uh, usage. No, one is the high cost of seeds. It's very expensive, and yet they are using the broadcast method. So there's also uh, they have difficulty also in finding the the source, no, or the supply of commercial seeds because uh, there are only very few who are producing the uh, who are uh, uh, rice seed producers. That that actually contributes why they have difficulty in finding the commercial seeds. No. And then, of course, the variety that they are commonly uh, uh, bought by the farmers are Syncrop and OM4900 and Karumdul. Now, if you look at the timeline, where when the farmers had started changing the seeds, it is within the uh, period of 2015 to 2020. I think this is where the project have uh, taken, uh, I mean, uh, have, gained, have, have gained momentum no? uh, in its implementation. So, I mean, suffice, suffice, it, suffice it to say that uh, this can be attributed to the project, no? why farmers are started changing the seeds. So look at the inputs also. There are around, um, there are very high uh, 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 um, number of suppliers who attended training of culture production because the project trained also the input suppliers. So the train, uh, yeah, so it's about the technical aspect, the legal aspect, and then uh, how to store, etc. Et so uh, uh, majority of the farmers no, uh, seek advice no, from input suppliers no, because we ask them, where did you get your, your uh, did you seek advice from the, uh, from the seed suppliers? No? Um, we also around, and from this, 65% uh, got advice from trained input suppliers. And then most of the farmers receive uh, guidance about three times or more no, on fertilizer utilization. And then uh, uh, around more than, uh, more than half no, uh, say that they comply with technical methods in uh, ap applying the fertilizers. So in terms of weeds, uh, mostly the farmers uh, use uh, chemical and mechanical method. So the farmers also source their pesticides from shops and input suppliers, and also from the ordinary market. And then uh, uh, um, a high number of uh, farmers uh, reported that they based on their usage of the pesticides and uh, uh, from the uh, uh, guidance no? from the government. Now, this is very quite interesting, no? because- uh, Sorry, Edward, yeah, yeah. Um, can you wrap up in a minute or two, please? Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, also the in post harvest losses, there are very high uh, reported uh, harvest losses, which is actually attributed to the um, uh, how do you call it the uh, uh, combined harvesters. So there are several also factors that would uh, affect the uh, uh, um, yield, and one of these is the uh, use of modern land labeling and in commercial uh, seeds. So. If you look also at the, the different, uh, how the project fares with the target, most of them are, most of the targets are, are achieved except for the post-harvest losses. So the target is uh, around uh, to reduce to 10%, but the project only at uh, the post-harvest losses is still around 12.31%. So this is the only indicator that uh, uh, the project have missed its target. So sorry for, for a long presentation. I just no, no, so sorry, sorry. 
thank you, Edward. I mean, this is interesting that the more details can be, um, the, I mean, as so we learned from just yeah. reading your, your presentation and also the, some of the separate report. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, just to give you that the sort of what the crop survey did was the, the target was this, the record the crop yields of the individual farmers. Sample size of households 390 and in, in their plots are geotagged during this crop survey. That's what we have done. Okay, so moving on to the next, and in that the, apart from the crop yield uh, data from the ground, what, what was really groundbreaking for us is to understand where all the pots are of the, the 16,000 households, and we haven't really been do, being able to spot this, so we asked our experts' help to in, indicate where they are from the sky. So let me invite uh, William Wu, director and co-founder of QED. Will, do you want to come in and share your screen, please? Yeah. OK, uh, thanks for inviting me. Let me share my screen. So can you guys see all this? Yes, perfect. Yeah, OK. So yeah, my name is William. Um, I'm going to be talking about the remote mapping work we did to map the rice paddy boundaries in Cambodia and the uh, selected regions. Um, so first, I want to just give a few minutes to introduce QED, because uh, I noticed uh, some of the topics in the in today's presentations are about what we can do during lockdown remotely, and uh, I think uh, that we have a lot of technologies that we could offer related to that topic. Um, so first, so we're a technology company, and what we do is we try to build data systems and AI that will help other organizations scale as they pursue uh, health and agricultural SDGs. Um, the way the company started was uh, my co-founder is a statistician. So she was working in, the, in development work for a very long time, back in 2008, I think is when she started uh, working in Uganda. As a statistician, often she felt that working in um, agriculture and health development, it felt like being a, a fish without water, because as a statistician, you need a lot of data. But where is this data? And um, I, I guess that's how the company evolved, by surrounding her by these software engineers who can build the systems to give, uh, to, to give the statistics the, the, the data that they need. Um, so. Yeah, our forte, I would say, is uh, trying to build technologies for challenging environments, uh, and enabling people to scale using software and, and AI. And um, these are just some examples of, of some of the kinds of tools we build. So if we needed to uh, remotely do a kind of plant telemedicine and diagnose what's wrong with certain plants in the field, uh, people take pictures with their phone, send it to this portal, and diagnose what's wrong remotely. Um, <clears throat> um, there's a lot of lab equipment, of course, needed in agriculture testing the quality of plants and soils. So we built uh, portable sensors that should be taken to the field to basically bring the lab to the field. Um, digital soil mapping was a, a big part of our life over the, the past 10 years with the APSIS project. And in the health space, these are some examples of trucks. So during a COVID lockdown and all, all of these uh, hospitals throughout Africa are highly constrained. So many people can't come to the clinic so we bring the clinic to them. And this is an example of a truck where we equip the whole truck with everything you expect in a hospital and send it out to um, treat HIV patients. Uh, this is an example of a project called ScanForm where people can use paper to collect data. And paper is very scalable. Um, you, know, you, can, you can easily distribute it, deploy it. You don't need a lot of training. The problem is always digitizing the data. And so we have a solution called ScanForm where you can take a picture of the handwriting on the form and digitize it. So you get the digital data. And uh, lastly today, what I'm gonna focus on is this idea of mapping croplands and building footprints from the sky using a satellite imagery. And there's so many applications to that, such as what we're gonna talk about today. So that's just a quick overview about our company. Uh, moving on. So our objectives in Cambodia, uh, we were asked to map these nine different uh, rice paddy areas in, in Cambodia. Uh, this is our first engagement in Cambodia, and it's also uh, not the last. It's really interesting to, to learn more about it. Um, and yeah, I, my understanding is it's about 16,000 uh, 16, hectares, roughly, total, spanning about 16,000 farming families, and that these plots had never been uh, identified individually before. So I'm going to talk about some of the tools we use to, um, to trace them. So first, we have a, a platform called GeoSurvey that I want to introduce to the audience. Uh, this has been used since at least 2013 or 2014, originally for soil mapping work. And the way this project started was, you know, we, uh, I showed that picture in the beginning where the person digging in the ground for soil, we were collecting soil all across Africa. And 
sometimes the SEAL team would come back to us and say, sometimes I'm just wasting my time. I, I, I dig the auger into the ground. I just hit rocks. And is there a way that you can guarantee I'm definitely going to go out there and collect cropland soil because it costs a lot of money and time to go out there and collect the soil. So we developed this web interface um, where people are shown random parts of the earth and they can label what they think are the crops. So here's an example from Nigeria where a person has hand traced uh, in orange all of the cropland areas. Um, so at, at first it started like that. And, and the field teams would come back and say, yeah, this, this really works. You're not wasting my time anymore uh, going on these expeditions. But then we also realized we can use that to train artificial intelligence. These are all just a lot of examples. And then the, the machine could learn from these examples and start mapping croplands all across the country in places like Tanzania, Ethiopia, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, and so on. Um, so since then, this, this tool has expanded. If you had drone imagery, you can feed that into here. If you have other kinds of... Um, even proprietary non-open imagery feeds that can accept it. And if you have photos from your phone, you can also throw that into the system and label uh, what you think is uh, uh, right or wrong or if you want to add to it. So uh, this is an example specifically from Cambodia. And um, here you can see actually some of the people who worked on this are, are in the call today. So hello, uh, so Dana and so on and Josephine. And um, here they're outlining every rice field separately. So you can see there's a simple interface for tracing um, tracing the areas that are inside this blue square. There's also a review interface. So we have the main experts like uh, David on, on the call, our digital agronomist, who can advise people um, how to trace these crop plants well, even in more challenging environments um, in other countries. And so we've been doing this kind of thing for quite some time in most of the countries in the world. Um, so here's some more examples, specifically from the uh, Cambodia study. And there's a nice interface where you can see you know, all of the different squares that someone has traced and um, you can analyze the performance and the quality that you can request that someone fix something. So there's a nice review process. Okay, so based on that, you know, using this tool, you, know, you, can, you can parallelize the work of uh, labeling this stuff. And if I click on, well, I'll let you guys inspect this link on your own time if you want, it's all open and out there. If you zoom in on this, this link, for example, you'll see something like this. So we've got nicely traced um, you know, boundaries for all of the plots. And uh, you can also toggle what you want to use as the base map. So we, we found that the Bing imagery tends to be much more updated. And if I zoom in on more of it, here's a, just an example where this is the original imagery and this is the, the layer that we have on top. Okay, so um, now let's talk about AI. So one can ask, why don't you just manually do this for, for everything? Why not map all the rice in Cambodia like this? So let's just do a quick back of the envelope calculation about that. Um, I, I learned there's about 3 million hectares of rice in Cambodia, roughly. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but something like this, okay? And so based on our calculations, if you had one person try to trace all that, it would take that person 23 years, assuming that person does nothing else, uh, 40 hours a week. And of course, by the time that person finishes the job, your map will be 23 years outdated. Now you could say, well, I could parallelize the work. What if I hire a crew of 50 people? I get it done in, let's say, half a year. That's pretty expensive. And you'll always have this problem of being outdated. You'll never be as fast as a computer. Um, so the bottom line is, I think if you want to scale up these kinds of operations, AI is really essential. And you also have to be, be willing to take some practical compromise. Maybe it won't be 100%. Maybe it won't be exactly what a human does. But you're going to be almost there. You might be like 85 90% there. Um, so our proposal is we think we can probably map all the rice in Cambodia at national scale. And I'd like to show you some, some tests we did. Um, so first, I need to give you a little bit of background. I'm trying to avoid the technical stuff, but just a little bit. So there's some ideas in computer vision you should know about. So here I've got some picture of sheep. And so the image recognition problem, um, you know, I think, I, what, what's the probability I have some sheep in here? 0.6 sheep, 0.3, there's a dog. Um, and then the things evolve. I have semantic segmentation. I say, these guys are all sheep. Um, and this one is a dog. Uh, and then we started detecting different objects uh, as so. I see there's three different uh, sheep here, but the boxes are overlapping, so it's a little bit sloppy. And now in 2021, we've got instant segmentation where you can say these are all three distinct sheep and here are their exact boundaries. So that's the kind of technology we're trying to apply to agricultural development as well. Um, I won't get into the details of how these neural networks work, but this is be becoming more and more used in urban environments, 
security cameras, trying to track people, cars, ships, um, plates, cups. And we're trying to apply the satellite imagery where I can trace exact um, households and croplands. So that's what we did. And um, here are some of the performance stats that we have so far. This is for nerds. I'm not going to get into what all these things mean. But there's, there's definitions for things like accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score. Um, there's trade-offs between these two. So if you want precision to be high, recall goes down. F1 score is a nice average between the precision and the recall. So uh, this is our current number, about 87.8%. I think it's pretty good. Um, but then let's just look at what does that mean, right? So here on the left-hand side is an example of satellite imagery. On the right-hand side is what our AI produced. So this is completely computer generated. Again, learning from you know, what, what we had uh, just done using hand tracing. And here's another example, um, the satellite imagery and the AI, satellite imagery and the AI. And if you look you know, closely at that, it's, it's pretty faint. It's hard to see those little boundaries, but the AI is doing pretty well in, uh, in isolating them. Um, so at, at the same maps portal, I've got the links here uh, on, on the screen, you can also see a comparison of um, pure AI versus humans, like human versus AI. And you can just zoom in on any one of these areas to take a look. So let's say I zoomed in right here. Um, this is the human traced version, right? And then I've got the AI generated one. So we can see you know, how similar are they? They're pretty similar. And I can also show them at the same time. Um, so any time, anywhere where you see the bright green fluorescent like energy peeking through, that shows a little bit of discrepancy. And usually that happens when we have some very small fields. Uh, when you have very small fields, there's even a debate amongst humans. I bet if we took a vote around here, many people disagree. Is that really a plot or is it a subplot? It's hard to know. But in general, I think the agreement is pretty good. Um, so I think that's, that's promise for things we could do in the future. Just a few remarks about other use cases for all this. Uh, we work on national cropland mapping in Nigeria. Uh, through the Gates Foundation. So this is something where we, we're just like semantic segmentation. We're trying to determine where is the cropland in Nigeria because there's no updated stats about that. How much of it is there? Where is it? And if we can do that, we hope we can get toward a key metric, which is the, what is the fertilizer use by crop? That's a really important uh, metric in order to in intensify agricultural, um, into, to have agricultural intensification by simply increasing the amount of fertilizer that's in the system, but we're not measuring um, what is the size of the market for the fertilizer industry. So this plot boundary mapping that we were just doing in Cambodia is also very relevant here. So here's an example in Nigeria, in a place called Sokoto, before and after, where we map all the little plot boundaries. And we want to do that because ultimately we would like to map the crop types. And we know the crop type shouldn't change too much from one plot boundary to another. So that plot boundary is a really important context that you want to get toward uh, crop type classification. This kind of information can then be superimposed with household information, right? So um, if I've got pictures of houses from the sky, I can start mapping all of their rooftops. And that was very uh, useful for electrification projects for some areas don't have much grid electricity and we want to help them plan out where to place the electrical grids. And all of that kind of information can then be uh, put together uh, actually across a whole nation. So, so this is a nice example I want to share with uh, the team here from a project called NSAF, Nepal Seed and Fertilizer Project. So here we actually mapped um, all of the houses, all the croplands, and everything you see here on the right-hand side, like agro vets, machine suppliers, financial institutions, to try to get a full picture of what does the, geos what does the agricultural ecosystem look like in one map? So as you can see, if I toggled all of these, these things on, it's overwhelming. This it doesn't even seem to make sense. But if you zoom in more, um, then we can start seeing all the details. So I think for the interest of time, I, I won't go into all of this, but you, you guys can certainly play with this site. It's open, it's online, and you can then inspect uh, each of the houses and um, details on your own. So I'll, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just skip that. And yeah, so, that's basically my talk. I just wanted to say there's many exciting use cases for, for mapping, like the ones I mentioned. And of course, uh, yield estimation, the, the uh, holy grail in agricultural development that we look forward to hearing uh, from the next speaker. And um, yeah, these maps, they also have the, the potential for affecting government policy. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, the, the previous map I just showed you was actually integrated 
into uh, Nepal's National Fertilizer Subsidy Program. Here's some pictures from, from that event. And so uh, it would be great if we could also have similar kinds of positive impact uh, in Cambodia one day. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for fascinating ideas. And in that, um, it takes a little bit more to consume for all of us this as to how we can make use of this for, for, for that uh, potential works. But uh, one thing we can, uh, just on, on my head, that the Cambodia is doing a lot of land use planning and also community development plan with a national scale. And if you put some of the plots and location of where those peoples are and, and where the properties, assets are, then you can make it into a sort of like an institutional based investment you know, they say enables that, that that not just a zoning land mapping, but it's a little bit more of the what the institution, individual, commune can do, and maybe the, the little bit more detailed, the, the more precise planning can be made available. And if the, with the help of the AI, um, it's feasible to do in the cost economically within a short period of time than spending decades <laughs> to map out yeah. that the individual plots. That's that's really interesting. Thank you so much. And then uh, uh, there's a question came from the accuracy of AI. But anyway, let's just uh, pose for, for that. I mean, for those lead that questions for the later. Let me invite the, the next speaker, Ren Thinking Machine, uh, with the crop yield survey and also the wheels and uh, the plot mapping, those two together, and then put that into a, the machine learning to come up with the crop yields. Let's hear from Ren about what the results and what the difficulties are. Ren, take it away. Thank you so much, Michiko, for the introduction. Um, wait, let me share my screen. Right. And... There. Um... Perfect, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. All right. Um, all right. So um, thanks again, Michiko, for inviting us here. So today, um, I'd like to talk about rice yield estimation with satellite imagery and machine learning. So um, but before we start, uh, I'd like to introduce um, Thinking machines first. So we are a full stack um, technology consultancy, which was founded in 2015. And we help organizations from both public and private sectors to use data to solve high impact problems and achieve their goals. So we help them integ integrate data into their overall strategy and operations through tools, platforms, and capacity building, regardless of their starting point. So our team is also is based in Southeast Asia, so we have offices in Manila, Bangkok, and in Singapore. So depending on the organization's stage in their data science journey, we can build, um, we do an assessment on how we can best help the organization. So um, we offer three key services and solutions. So first we have data platforms, um, wherein we build central data warehouses to, um, to host their data in a secure and accessible way um, for the stakeholders. So this gives them a more organized and um, easy access to their data sets so they can make the most out of it. So on top of this, we can also build custom um, AI solutions from document processing to geospatial analytics. And lastly, um, we make sure that our work with the clients and partners are scalable um, with their capacity. So we also do capacity building um, through hands-on trainings, consultations, and coaching. So um, to walk you through how ML and AI um, support um, use cases, especially in um, agriculture, uh, I wanted to um, walk you through how we develop the crop yield estimation model to give you a better under understanding um, of how ML works. So just to give a background of the project, um, we worked with ADB to estimate yield using machine learning and satellite images. So um, we developed the predict a prediction model using the survey data conducted on 390 households in 20 2020, um, earlier um, discussed by um, Edward. So thank you for that dis um, helpful discussion. And um, we use different earth observation data sets such as um, Sentinel-2 images and other environmental um, geospatial data sets um, as features that 
depict plant health and their growing conditions. So at the end of the project, we were able to provide predictions for 67 roughly 67,000 plots of the 16,000 unsurveyed households um, under this program. And um, in addition, we created a web map to display these results. So um, I'm sure this was already shared with you and I hope you already had a chance to explore this um, web map. So to start off, here's an overview of the process. So we begin with data gathering. Um, all of these data sets are open geospatial data sets available through Google Earth Engine. So Google Earth Engine is just a repository for open source data sets and it's um, very easily accessible. So next is we process this data to have the same spatial scale as the uh, yield data um, from the survey results to be machine learning ready. After that, we performed experiments and validations to come up with the best model suited for the data. Uh, finally, we also did a deep dive into how the model works um, and did error analysis before rolling out on the unsurveyed um, households. So let me just turn this on. All right. So first off, here's um, are the different categories of data that we used. So we have three categories. Uh, the target labels, which is the yield per house per household in tons uh, per hectare. Um, next, uh, so this is this came from the survey um, data. Then we have satellite images. So we used Sentinel two, which is a ten meter um, by ten meter resolution and timely coverage for Cambodia, and it's publicly available. So for this, um, from this, we also um, created different vegetation indices, which are just satellite data manipulations to highlight plant growth and health. So this gives us an idea of the actual state of the crops, um, of the crops growth. Um, lastly, we have um, different environmental features, um, such as, let's say, temperature, the amount of rainfall, the area received, and um, also slope and all that um, different um, descriptors to give us a good idea of the growing conditions um, in the specific plots. So we, we downloaded the weekly um, average of these data sets to create a time series uh, data. So here is a full list of features that um, we use to protect the model. So we have environmental features that depict the overall growing conditions and a number of satellite derived features that mainly indicate um, that mainly indicate plant health. So after acquiring the data sets, we have to process it so that it will be at the same spatial scale as the surveyed data. Um, the slide summarizes how each category was processed. So for the target labels, um, we have to append it to the plot generated by QED, which was also shared with us. So um, amazing um, work here. Um, we, were, we also appended the weekly features to the plots by getting their statistical aggregations. So we did the same for the satellite features and environmental features. And we got the plot level, minimum, maximum, standard deviation, and all those other um, statistical aggregations. Um, finally, um, well, the next step is actually model training. So we tested different model architectures and per, um, parameters and combinations of the um, features to see which one works best for our use case. We assessed each model using scores such as mean, absolute error, and R squared. So to share um, the model accuracy of the one we developed, um, we were able to come up with a model with the mean absolute error of 0.56, which can be interpreted as our predictions can be off by plus or minus 0.56 tons per hectare. And to give you um, a, a baseline for this, the average yield per plot based on the survey ranges from two to eight tons per hectare. Another measure is the R squared, which we got 0.46. Um, and this can be um, interpreted as the model features were able to explain 46.8% of the variation in the rice yield values. So finally, um, the model can also give us insights on what features are the most influential um, in predicting rice yield. So we looked into feature importance. So what this does is assign scores 
to input features of the predictive models um, relative to how much they impact uh, the amount, uh, the, um, the number of the predicted yield. So here we, um, we can see the top 10 most important features. So um, ranked from most important to um, least important, but I'm only showing 10. Uh, we used um, roughly 90 features for this model. And as you can see, um, recurring in the top 10 features are soil surface moisture, soil subsurface moisture, and land surface temperature. So um, soil moisture is actually, um, according to um, previous re um, research, is actually um, a big factor in um, cultivating rice, um, rice crops. And land surface temperature is a satellite-based um, temperature measurement, which according to research papers, are also um, a good indicator of plant stress. So um, it kind of makes sense that these are the top features for the model. Um, so as part of model analysis, we also looked into the range of values predicted by, by the model. So in this chart, you will see how many plots have yield that falls within different um, bins or value ranges, as you can see in the um, axis here. So the purple bars, the one behind, um, show, show the distribution of the survey data. So while the orange shows the distribution of predicted values for the unsurveyed um, uh, 67,000 plots. So as you can see, um, a bulk of the training data falls within the range of 3.5 to 5 tons per hectare. So this led the model to predict more or less within the same range. Um, so this plot shows you the um, yield values for the dry season. Um, the same can be seen in the early wet se season yield distribution, where values also range um, from 3 so a bulk of the values also range from 3.5 to 5. And as you can see, um, the same it can be said for the predicted um, yield estimates. So again, it can also be observed for the wet season with a slightly different range of 2.5 to 5 tons per hectare. So um, to summarize the discussion, um, after predicting the yield, for the unsurveyed plots, we developed this web map as you can see in the image. So um, Michika was able to share the link to this web app. So I hope um, you've already, uh, you had the chance to explore the web app and how it works. So this allows users to view and analyze the data at any granularity they need and view both the survey and predictions data. So this project also shows the potential of using remote sensing and machine learning for crop monitoring. Given that it only used um, open source remote sensing data, we we're still able to provide insight into crop yield gap at the individual, um, at the individual plot level. This also shows how remote sensing can provide valuable granularity and timely information. It also highlighted how we can make the most of survey data by expanding it using machine learning. So um, this can be done at a fraction of the cost of um, doing survey across um, all of the plots, uh, all of the households involved. So um, thank you so much again for having us. So I, I hope we were able to shed more light on ML applications for crop monitoring and how it can be an advantage for your work. So we hope to be able to collaborate with you again in the future to um, build this model. So um, again, thank you. And I give the floor back to Michiko. Thank you very much, Ren. Um, we've been mingle playing with this map for a long while within the project office and also <laughs> mingling among ourselves and what we can be utilized and discuss about that. But let's hear um, from the uh, the group of other the people what they think of this. And let's just invite the that we, we have a uh, 15 minutes or so to discuss about this uh, questions and answer as well. Then um, we have our colleague Chantu joining us and also the Leo, both of them are working on this uh, Rice SDP projects and including additional financing. And then I, I would also invite that uh, representative from MAF. Uh, I understand Mr. Opik and others might be able to come in and comment. And then also lastly, also Navin can also comment on this one. Uh, can we invite first uh, um, Chantu? Chantu, do you want to come in? 
uh, Ren, while we wait, is it possible to show the website map, the result, and so that people can see? Sure. Um, let me just bring that up okay. quickly. Chantu, are you here? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. So, uh, sorry. So, so, okay, you, you come along and then we can't really share the map then. Anyway, okay, please go ahead, Chantu. Uh, no problem, you can share the map. I'm happy to uh, see the, the progress of the work has been done. And of course, the agriculture sector, especially Ministry of Agriculture, and also the work with the smallholder development in other projects, I think we can also uh, benefit from this exercise. And uh, I, I think uh, in the future, may we also apply into other areas uh, rather than just this uh, specific uh, piloting. So I'm uh, still also learning together with all of you. Thank you. That's it, Chantu. You're very quiet today. <laughs> okay. Um, Leo, do you want to come in? Hi, thank, thank you, Michiko. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for inviting me to, to, to this uh, session. It's very informative. I can, like, like everyone else, I'm excited, you know, to see the potential of this, not just for the purpose of a project evaluation, but even for a setting baseline, you know, for the purpose of uh, processing or, you know, uh, implementation. Monitoring. I do have some uh, uh, some questions. So a uh, comment. So actually, those are maybe a bit naive because I, I'm just new to this. Uh, but yeah, uh, um, one issue is on the MAE because you mentioned the MAE is uh, is around zero point five eight. Oh, actually, uh, sorry. Let me take a step back. I see in the invitation right, uh, uh, there's a statement that the um, the crop yield estimate is not yet uh, uh, accurate yet. You know, uh, the the prediction is not uh, good enough for project monitoring. Um, my question, uh, I have two questions on that. Number one is, can we at least use the, uh, find a way to make use of the MAE estimate to produce a conservative estimate uh, that, you know, that we are comfortable with for the purpose of reporting. Say if uh, your mean, right? I mean, your predicted value is say uh, five tons hectares. If I have an MAE of, 0 0.583, can I somehow make use of that 0 0.583 to give me, you know, to def defer what is the conservative you uh, estimate that we can use uh, for, yeah, for, you know, to report to the management with, with, with confidence that we know at least the project, I mean, the project areas have a yield of, you know, uh, five, five, five tons after no, adjusted, you know, after, after the adjusting for the MAD. Uh, that's uh, one question. The second question is, um, um, you mentioned that the, I mean, again, from the same uh, line, it was said that, however, the use of remote sensing has shed light on the crop uh, yield gap. But then I happens, I see other, uh, uh, in the phase one, the, in the surf, I mean, the, in the household survey of that 390 household, it um, no significant no significant yield gap is identified from from that survey. So you know between a, 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 between a female and a male household, or between a lease a land that is leased versus land that is owned. Um, so why I'm just wondering why do we if there's I mean in the actual surveys right I mean there's no uh, gap is yield gap is identified. Why do we see there's a uh, uh, crop yield gap in the predicted values. Uh, that's it for now. Thank you. Right. Um, so to address your first question, um, yes, so we can use um, the MAE to give us a good idea of how close or how far off our predictions are. are. Um, we also provided, uh, as part of the first phase of this project, we provided an in-depth um, exploratory data analysis, comparing our uh, predic predictions and actual yield data for our training data set. So this involves all the data points that um, we were able to gather from the survey plots. So at least um, comparing the predictions for these plots um, and the ground truth, uh, we get a good idea of um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the model predictions, which can um, in turn guide us in um, interpreting the predicted um, yield results for the rollout uh, data. 
So as I also um, highlighted earlier, um, in this particular um, slide, so it shows one of the limitations wherein uh, we were um, able to predict um, at a specific range only. So this is um, one helpful guide to interpreting the predictions. So to address your um, second question, um, so for the survey, uh, for the survey um, house uh, data, uh, they were um, these are at the household level. So our goal here is to actually disaggregate that household level um, yield um, value to a specific um, plot level. So to give more context, um, each household can have um, as many as one to five plots of land um, under that household. So our predictions are actually at, um, we um, built the model in a way that we would predict um, at the plot level. So we can see like, um, um, theoretically we can see which households, uh, which specific plots um, have more or, um, which have which have more or less um, yield compared to uh, the other plots. So um, does that answer your question? Thank you, Ren. Can I just, in the interest of time, can I invite the two more comments first and then we can do the discussion? Yeah, and in the meantime, if I may ask you, Ren, can you zoom in and show the, this, what you're seeing in the screen is the estimated, all the, all the crop yields of the entire project area based on the survey and also the plot, uh, the mapping plot that came from the Wills team. Now, uh, maybe you can play around with this at the, can you show some of the things like uh, the survey, the household and then in a different season. So, in, and then while, while Ren's playing around and showing you what, what you can see in this map, uh, can I invite a uh, representative from the map for comments, please, uh, Mr. Opik or Whoever, I, I was told that Mr. Opik's gonna share some comments. Are you there, Mr. Opik? Yes. Good morning, Ken. Thank you. That is to the crop uh, In general, in Cambodia, we have two parts of the crop year. First one is the for dry season. The, the year here uh, between 2.5 to 5 ton per car. But for the wet season, it's around 2.5 to 5 ton. It's different between dry season and wet season. But regarding to the, to the you call aggregation year, I also have no, no skill on that. But it, it, for the map point of view, it's very good to apply for the culture as well. But how to accurate estimation, estimate our crop year and not clear about the technology, but it's very good as well for the sheep culture. I have some comments to to clear about the project and the system calculation of the plot here. And uh, compared to the survey, of course, so far, Mark and, uh, Mark and my own, also the last survey, the first thing we love the questionnaire and we ask the farmer is part of the Then we have a, one system that developed by Ebert. We have for the result is around three to three three thousand per star to four thousand per star. He compared to the the CIS, the way it is different. But of course, but I'm not sure about the, what is the 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 crop year accurate. Between uh, the survey that we have farmer and the uh, satellite, that I'm not sure that we really, are really only based on the, the actual the farmer that is in the project province. Yes. But 
Of course, I'm still a problem aid for the technology is very good as well. But in the future, how to improve, uh, how to improve, how to apply in Cambodia in the future. Thank you. That is very good. Thank you, Mr. Pick. Um, I think everybody says seem to be sort of like a pondering about how ac accuracy, how it should be. Maybe we can discuss about this later. I think there's a major point that everybody is interested in. Um, can can I invite? Is there any other who's uh, would like to speak out uh, on behalf of math? Is there anybody? Um, if not, then can I invite my colleague Naving? for his comment, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Michika san. So I think uh, there's a few points, forward looking points and some, some thoughts on this work. I think uh, this is a, a really a major step uh, in terms of uh, how we can use satellite imagery. Uh, you know, satellite use of satellite imagery is not a question of if in the future, it's, it's just when the countries are going to you know, um, take it forward. So. So it's a, it's a, it's in, in my in the progression of agriculture it's a, it's a it's an evolutionary step that's going to happen so i think i commend uh, these efforts you know uh, that are coming uh, uh, to, to move in that direction so that's the first point the second one was uh, you know rice specifically has a lot of significance to the asia and the pacific and um, you know but it's also resource intensive and uh, you know increasingly uh, when sustainability and uh, climate related aspects are becoming important i think um, getting a handle on how well we can uh, increase the yields of rice while ensuring uh, emissions are low and then also satellite imagery becomes again very important. So I think this is also uh, in that regard a great step. Um, the third thing is, um, you know, we have institutes like uh, IRRI, uh, which have amazing amount of knowledge across all aspects of rice cultivation. And, uh, um, you know, we can only imagine adding other aspects of uh, rice cultivation, like fertilization management, to what's already done here, uh, to basically transmit that knowledge. And I think uh, this is one way we can do it. And uh, an interesting aspect I found here also in this work is connecting the household survey data with the satellite imagery, uh, which means that we have now a direct access to how gender plays a role on, let's say, yield across various plots, right? And 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 this kind of information. Uh, in the long run, we can actually use to uh, make corrections and you know uh, customize the data based on who and what the profile of the farmer is. So I think that's another uh, area. Um, there is also some discussion on the errors uh, on the yields that we're talking about. But you know we can always use this data no matter what the error is. And let me give a perspective why that is. So if the error is very very low, that means farmers can use it right without any concern. But let's say the error is like 20%, uh, maybe it's probably not useful for the farmers, but at the district level or a province level, when you aggregate all of it, you still get a better picture of how uh, the, the province is performing. So as long as the error is reasonable, there is always a way to find a value for the data, right? So that's uh, that's another perspective that I wanted to add. And um, you know, yield estimation is a tricky problem, you know, uh, to say the least. I mean, there is genetic impl implications, how you sow, everything's going to influence the yield. So, uh, so you know, this is going to be a long-term problem in many ways. So this is a good, but this is a good first step. So uh, let me commend the work that the team has done there. Uh, one aspect I wanted to bring forth is, if you take a look at all of the uh, work that's been done so far, it's, it's backward looking. So we are looking at satellite data and then trying to predict the yield, right? But in, in with climate change having an impact, uh, one uh, focus area could be is, how can we merge forecast data, like you know, uh, probability of extreme events, along with the satellite imagery to create more better yield prediction? So there is a lot of scope where I think uh, uh, this work can take forward, and uh, and our uh, 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 and, and the country of Cambodia can actually show the way in many ways for smallholders. And um, last but not the least, there's a small. I just wanted to uh, reflect on the map. Uh, it would be better if we can show the legend rather from zero to the maximum yield. And so of that, if you can show, let's say 20, 30% of the, so that, you know, the map looks a lot more, you know, there's more colors popping out. And then we, we can actually see the variation, right? So that's just one small uh, change. Yeah, Thank, back to you, Mujib. Thanks. Thank you very much, Navin. Um, I think uh, 
I think you touch upon the very important points as well. I mean, is that that the, with just the feedback from the, the previous discussions, we several meetings that we had that the, the project office individually and as a group, everybody is concerned about this and what is error, what is acceptable error, how accurate it should be when it comes to project monitoring. You know this, and then also. Um, thinking about this you know crop survey if you ask the, the farmers you know how what's your yield for that, that this season last season all the recall birth you know things that how accurate it's going to be we don't really do this uh, the cut harvest just the, the, by the third party to measure the accurate sort of uh, um yield for the each crop so there was so layers of errors to start with in a traditional crop survey as well so and I think goes back to the point of Leo, it's like, uh, okay, so how can we utilize this with this is not really, really accurate, but it, and for the certain purpose and we among ourselves, so we're thinking, I personally believe that it's a very, very good pivot system that we can bring to the farmers and say, show in totality, not just a sample of 390 household plots. I think that Ren was showing you the red spots, purple spots, just the scatter ones. That's a surveyed household data that came from the crop survey, but based on which in the machine learning with these said that the satellite images, we can see in totality is a more or less how that the project area is doing in terms of each season or the cropping in terms of yield. And we want to bring that to that the communities. We want to, with the permission with the project officers and particularly the, the Excellency Selva, we like to Based of show this data set, I mean, in the mapping, coloring mapping, and show it to the, the, the group of farmers, particularly women groups, and say, where's your plot? And how did you perform? Is this accurate that you're doing better than that, or you're doing not doing as well that matters, or something? That sort of discussion and why that is. You know, we want to introduce this uh, the discussion of crop yields. We often talk about in a food security agenda saying, if, you know, with the existing technology closing the crop yield gaps in individuals, and you can save the world. But we don't even know it within our project area, each one of the, the pods, how they're performing. So it's a very good uh, the sort of starting point to show in totality, start with something. I mean, that's the, the one of the point that the Navin was making. So, so that's so far as our Rice SDP discussion. Let, let's bring in that the expert, subjects expert from Erie. I'm really grateful that uh, Emma, Dr. Emma Kicho, if I, Am I correctly pronouncing your name? Emma, um, thank you for joining us today. And if you can share the relevant best practices in the area on a crop yield estimation, I understand you've got a lot of uh, the relevant uh, study done elsewhere in India and all, all the other places. If you can comment on that, that uh, some, some suggestion that you might have for the crop yield uh, the estimation work and also to share some of the, the tips coming from the relevant global best practice. Emma, thank you. Please come in. Thank you. Thank you, Michiko. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, uh, correction. I am not yet a doctor, but it's a good premonition. So, hopefully one day I would be one. So, <laughs> thank you for that. Anyway, so I'm here because my supervisor is not available at the moment because of the time difference. So, uh, with a short notice, uh, we were able to come up with something. It's not really a perfect one, but this is how we do the yield estimation. Thank you so uh, much. Based, yeah, based on our project. Um, there is a project at Kiri called Arise. It's um, a remote sensing based information and insurance for um, uh, crops in emerging economies. So it started in 2013 and, and it until now it's been going on for uh, at least some of the locations that we have so again good morning to all i am here to present what we are currently doing at iri basically the title of my presentation is about the integration of remote sensing um, information and crop model for uh, yield estimation so uh, why do we need a model um Yield data or information um, is an important um, information so that we could anticipate what would be the production like at the end of the season. How would affect, how would it affect the market? And at the same time, um, this would be an important information for us to be able to plan for our import or export and as well as for the regional policy, local or regional policy support that would um, 
will be providing to the farmers. So basically, ability to be able to um, make the yield estimates um, during the middle of the season and right after the harvesting, uh, using the remote sensing information can be uh, very important and uh, would be very timely for our decision makers. So with the use of uh, frequent remote sensing information, um, there is now a potential for us to be able to provide yield at a quantitative basis, especially detailed and timely information. Likewise, with this remote sensing, uh, this can be used for damage assessment or damage um, estimation, uh, particularly in the case of the Philippines, where in we, we do have uh, a lot of typhoons every year, and I think it's the same in Cambodia. Uh, it could also provide us um, better statistics in rice area, in yield, and also in production. And um, this um, rice data that we are generating um, can be used also. And, and I think at the moment, some of the crop insurance are using it for their program. And uh, also further research um, still be needed, although we are doing this, but still uh, further um, research and development are are always required for uh, improvement. So the crop growth simulation model, um, uh, CGESM as we call it, uh, like RISA, DSAT, or any other um, crop models are basically um, working on three main factors, which is the, the, the interaction between the G by E and by M. When I say G, it's more on the phenotype or the maturity or the characteristic of the variety. And then when I say E, it would be pertaining to weather and soil information and the management is like, what is the irrigation system? How much fertilizer is being applied by farmers? So RISA, which is um, basically working only for rice, is an ecophysiological model which, uh, which simulate um, growth and development um, in rice, uh, including um, water, carbon, and nitrogen balance in different rice ecosystems, whether it's be in the lowland or upland or uh, in any conditions. And it could also provide us production in different conditions as well, whether um, you want to have a potential yield or you know, water limited, nitrogen limited, or a combination of both. So those can, uh, ORISA, ORISA could do that. However, um, ORISA itself is uh, point-based. When we say point-based, it's only at the field level. And um, at the moment, <clears throat> given that field level condition that you would simulate, it would need a lot of information. Um, it would be very hard for us to be able to, um, to, to provide yield estimates for all the locations of the rice area if we will be doing this with ORISA alone. So that's why, um, um, it says here that our RISA is not special, so that's why we are bringing in the remote sensing information so that we could um, uh, have an integration of the two um, systems so that we could um, provide more special yield. So basically, in all the crop models, um, these are the main factors that are affecting the crop yield. So it's mainly management, the genotype, the weather and the soil, and um, Pests and diseases. However, in Orisa's case, um, please note that um, at the moment, um, pests and diseases are not yet being uh, considered. So, under these different factors, are a lot of different parameters that are being considered in the model. And this is something that uh, uh, us human could not do it on our own. That's why we need a model. All these interactions are are required for us to be able to generate some uh, some yield information. So basically how we do it in the project is um, with the remote sensing information, uh, we use the leaf area index as our proxy coming from the remote sensing and also the start of the season. So uh, we use the remote sensing information also to calibrate the model. Like for example, in a particular location, it would not always be the same for a particular location. So we always have to calibrate the model for a specific locations because each locations, um, like each country would have different um, conditions. Uh, what is new in this method is that we are linking three pieces of software together. Um, Mapscape Rice is basically the one that, um, that uh, what do you call that, um, process the remote sensing information for us to be 
helpful to come up with the rice area, the start of season, and then the LAI values or the LAI max. And then ORISA itself is the crop model. And then there is another one, the rice year, uh, yield estimation system, or what we call it rice yes. Rice yes. It is an interface that connects or integrates this mapscape information and the rice information so that we would be able to uh, provide spatial yield. So these so far are uh, more user friendly as compared to other, um, I mean, when, when we compare it with RISA itself. And then this is more robust because over different um, G by E by M uh, interactions, um, this can be uh, done easily. It is more fa uh, faster and efficient as well because uh, right now we could we could uh, generate yield like for example for the whole country in one processing that we have and then it could also provide us a mid season and then end of season yield uh, information so how how do we do it so uh, on your on your right is where what satellite information are we using um, so far we are using sentinel 1a and Sen sentinel 1b so these are uh, open open source data and free and on your left is the diagram or our operational diagram for yield estimation in here the orange one you can see here is all the mapscape rice processing this is where you generate the rice area the start of season and then the lai maps or the lai in raster form and this LAI then is then converted into the relative growth rate of leaves, wherein this is the parameter that ORISA reads for us to be able to include into the model. And then along with the weather data, the variety information on the soil and the management, and then the rice yes could um, provide us the yield information uh, spatially. So this is a sample data. Um, basically, it's 2016. Um, I could not get hold of the latest data that we have for uh, for um, Cambodia, but this is um, the early wet season um, result of the rice area in the raster form and also the SOS. Um, the LAI is missing. Um, uh, I, I could not get hold of it because of the lack of time to look for the data, but then um, these are the important informations that are being used for, for yield estimation. Um, so basically, how, how do we use leaf area index in, 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 in the yield estimation coming from the remote sensing? So in this graph, this is just basically to illustrate how the leaf area index is being used. So the green line here is um, basically the day-to-day the -day LAI values when we run it into the ORISA. So because ORISA can provide you a daily output of the leaf area index as well as yield. So without um, without considering the remote sensing information, this is how our um, leaf area index uh, looks like. Uh, this uh, particular um, leaf data comes from one of our sites in Agusan del Norte. So on your y-axis is uh, the leaf area value, and then on the x-axis is your um, day of year. So we start in January until December. So basically this um, simulation is done for the wet season. So the LAI could go as high as four. And uh, during the, the once um, the, the, the grain peeling start, we could also generate or simulate the yield. And so far, this is the yield that we get so far when we simulate that particular leaf area index and other information from the location. Um, and also we have the observed data coming from three replicates in that particular location. So it's like um, our um, simulated yield is six and then our uh, observed data from the field is around five tons per hectare. We also have these two points wherein this is the remote sensing leaf area index. So basically you see why um, there is a big difference between the inferred um, uh, leap area index as compared to our simulated one. So this is how we do it. So then we, with the remote sensing LAI and then our crop yield model using an algorithm, we now um, have a new LAI values that could be used and then um, generate the yield as well that is more or less closer to the to the um, observed yield in the field. So the discrepancy could, um, yeah, 
uh, rely, uh, there is a big difference between the blue and the green lines because of, um, basically in the green one, we only simulated it, but no, no, no other information, um, I mean, was uh, coming from the remote setting. So basically, from from ORISA, which is a uh, which is a field based um, yield estimation, with additional of the remote sensing information, we could now generate a spatial yield information. So using all of these um, backscatter and all and um, and uh, the processing that we do in Mapscape, we could generate um, yield. Um, this is also one update that we use because at, at the moment, the resolution of the maps is 20 by 20. It's a pixel size. The pixel size is 20 by 20 meters. So if we would run each pixel by pixel, then in for one location, we will have like a million rats or more so. So what we do an up, as an upgrade in the system also is try to classify the LAI and group all those informations that are uh, having the same values, having the same... Um, um, more or less weather information and then the same of start of season and we we make that as one run and then by doing this uh, we have been efficient in in generating the yield because in the past at the beginning when we start this rice project we are um using the um still the old method when in we're in it would take us a while like for example we will leave the computer overnight and the ne next morning when we come it's still running but given this um classification of the the different information or grouping them into different information we could now um, uh, generate a yield more faster and more efficient and uh basically these are the 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 how the system uh, works. So we created this information uh, graph yield um, input for CYM graph yield model. So basically those includes the information of the LUT ID because we need a lookup table later again when we remap the yield. There is as, um, information on the weather data, on the soil information, as well as the leaf area index. So, and those are the informations that we need to be able to run the yield estimates. So basically, from the rice area earlier and the SOS, this is the generated yield map for, for Cambodia in early wet season 2016. So this is in raster uh, form. Uh, we have this at different admin level as well, but uh, we will not be showing it in here. So um, how do we validate our yield? So basically, due to lack of um, for the crop cut experiments data because using a uh, collecting crop cut every other field would also be um very very uh, tasking and uh, costly and everything so uh, uh in in this paper that we did we validate our um, yield estimates using the reported yield information from from the government from each of the government basically these sites written here are our um, location project locations during the rice phase one of um, uh, rice project and the agreement um, somehow we are happy with agreement it's running from 81 to 92 percent as compared to the um, official reported yield um, one of the things that we could also use the remote sensing is um, through damage assessment so given this one um we this is a case that we did in india one of our rice monitoring locations um we use um at mapscape they also have this uh flood generation module or flood map module wherein you generate the flood map um we have this uh here the mid-season yield forecast and then uh suddenly towards the end of the season or before the season ends actually a uh, cyclone came in this particular location and these are mostly the flooded areas. So with the remote sensing information as well as with ORISA crop model, we were able to um, generate how much area was flooded and what is the effect on the yield. So basically uh, this is uh, on the lower part is our end of season um, yield considering the flood locations and the effect of flood during that particular season so overall rice flooded area was around um, 69,000 hectares and the estimated yield loss 
is like 1.5 tons per hectare for those uh, really affected areas. So, okay. And then um, where do the rice yield products um, are being used at the moment? So right now, most of the, uh, there are some insurance companies that are um, somehow involved um, and are using the rice products. Uh, one example is in Vietnam. There is ongoing implementation of yield-based uh, crop insurance in Vietnam in collaboration with Switzerland. So um, mainly the, the work is being done by um, IAP and CTU uh, along with MARD, of course. And then in Cambodia, there is also a dry run insurance test plan for monsoon rain in 2020. Um, and Dr. Sengbang is, is in the audience, so he could uh, maybe he could add something if he wants to. But yeah, at the moment, this is being done in, in, in Cambodia as well. And then it was also used in, in Tamil Nadu in some of the states in India, particularly in Tamil Nadu and in um, Andhra Pradesh. So Okay, so these are mostly where all the methodologies are, are fully discussed because uh, given the, 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 the time that we have and all, um, we could not really fully discuss, but um, this on your right is the full methodology, how we generate the rice area, the SOS and all. And then these uh, two publications on the left is where we in detail discuss how the yield estimation is being done using the remote sensing and the ORISA crop model. With that, uh, thank you very much and thank you for uh, listening. Thank you very much, Ahmad. This is really, really rich content and it's a very, very good sort of like a practical information as well. I mean, one thing that you mentioned about this uh, directly relevant for the rice SAP is the, uh, that the linkage to this um, uh, crop insurance work. I mean, it's the Rice SDP is also doing the pilot testing on this uh, the insurance policy for the, in the in the area. So um, there there's an implication to that too. But the, um, in Unfortunately, it's been one hour and a half, and I think many of the, the participants might need to run for the next meeting. So in the interest of time, maybe we want to close this session. And then I, I'm, and for, for those of you who want to play around the, the map and the questions answer a little bit further for another 15 minutes or so, please stay on. I'm going to stay on because I want to ask a little bit more questions on that too. So let me just invite just for the closing, and then I just wanted to ask for the permission from a, a Project Director, the, uh, His Ex Excellency uh, Selva, from the uh, the discussion, based on this expert's discussion, if there's any sort of like uh, uh, comments that you have, the suggestion that you might have, and also I would like to seek specifically the, the permission to move on to this, uh, utilize this uh, result sharing with the, uh, the group of uh, the farmer um, beneficiaries. That's one we would like to do. And, and then we, we already sort of planning to do that, a field discussion, either based on WhatsApp or Facebook, if it's the face-to-face -face is not allowed, or that uh, if there's the opportunity for this a small group discussion, we want to do that with the women farm farmers groups. And then we want to show this map and then we start discussing about the crop yield differences in each of the plot. Uh, another thing that we would like to consider for the, the Rice SDP, the project office, is that some of the experts who has worked on this would like to make use of this data sets and then for the for the publication of the case study development. And for that to happen from ADB side, once the, the data is uh, the disseminated in public, we I mean, it's a public property in, in our point of view, but it's, there might be some procedure for the endorsement or screening for this before the, any publication is going to be done based on the, on the result. Um, for that, uh, uh, the guidance we would like to seek. So those two points, uh, uh, Your Excellency Selva, if there's a certain guidance, please, please come in. Uh, thank you, Michiko. Uh, thank all the participants and especially the uh, speaker, the presenter of uh, this three uh, or four uh, presentation, I find them very useful, but uh, have some reservation in terms of how to uh, bring those uh, work uh, forward. But it's not a, 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 a kind of a, a 
instruction to uh, uh, our ambition to move forward uh, in promoting agriculture at uh, to uh, push you to think a little bit harder how uh, we can make a change in our uh, work uh, going forward. So I would have uh, some uh, suggestion to, to consider. Uh, so um, first, uh, I appreciate uh, that book. Uh, very uh, useful, not just for the uh, evaluation or assessment purpose uh, of the uh, rice SDP, but uh, it have uh, uh, some more positive, uh, uh, important uh, implication for uh, maybe uh, for uh, planning future project uh, baseline uh, data use or application. But also for the two things that uh, you just mentioned and uh, the presenter also pointed out on the uh, the, uh, the the usefulness for the, the uh, crop insurance or uh, the uh, insurance product. I think uh, we uh, try to introduce a, a crop insurance in Cambodia, and uh, I see the potential uh, to scale up this uh, work. Uh, to work alongside with private sector, so hope that uh, uh, this uh, uh, can contribute to to, to that uh, uh, process. Uh, second, uh, I don't know how uh, uh, the project can help uh, relevant ministry, especially the Ministry of uh, Agriculture, to institutionalize. Uh, this uh, idea, the method, uh, the technology, uh, so that uh, they can uh, um, uh, further use for for policy uh, making uh, for planning purposes, uh, 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 a broader application of uh, this. So, uh, if anything we can do, uh, just uh, let us know. I, I'm asking. Uh, the MAF uh, uh, representative as well as uh, uh, people involved in the project, especially you, if uh, you can push a little bit harder, can uh, maybe uh, after the project we somehow uh, uh, can leave some uh, uh, specific uh, uh, footprint with the uh, MAF on this, uh, maybe uh, the, the application, the, uh, the, the model for uh, uh, rice crop uh, yield uh, estimation uh, with the team at MAP. Uh, my next, uh, maybe the, the other point, I think, uh, on uh, uh, we are uh, almost approaching the closer of the project, and I uh, find it very useful if we could uh, have a more. Uh, uh, comprehensive uh, evaluation of uh, project uh, activity and uh, appreciate that uh, this uh, method could be used to enlighten the, the outcome of the project and set some uh, direction for uh, future project uh, program activity or maybe uh, in, to include uh, some specific uh, case study in that uh, using that uh, specific uh, data and uh, technology to uh, uh, enrich the information and ana analysis uh, on that. So that uh, all uh, uh, my uh, idea for, for this, uh, I, I look forward to work with all of you that if uh, in any way possible, I, 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 I will try my best to, to coordinate that even uh, the resource that to, to maybe uh, in the, uh, the uh, framework of the project that we can support to, to that uh, endeavor. So thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to listen to, to all the presentation and thank you for your invitation and engaging me in this uh, process. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, back to you, uh, Mr.
Thank you so much, that, that, uh, your, your Excellency. Um, three points, very important. And all of them are so well perceived. I mean, the one is about the relevance of cross ins insurance. Maybe we, we can, we still have time because the project will be extended. So we would have to think a little bit more like integration of the better data sets being the crop modeling of the, this uh, application approach. That's what well noted uh, that the relevance of this set uh, a little bit more like what we have heard and presented it just that uh, we see this as a start of the how differently we can deal with you make use of the data so you you made a very valid point policy making will benefit from a little bit more like a granular sort of information that's coming from the ground right so we we we, we were happy to continue working with this at that the real ministry and also math uh, there's a multiple of the interesting that, that uh, the initiatives are running. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm really appreciating for, for your continued support. And then the last point that GFSP forces us to do the proper evaluation anyway, so we will engage you. And as you mentioned, this said uh, that's a sort of, uh, it's not gonna replace it in the traditional uh, rigorous evaluation that we need to take place. And that's gonna take place, but it's said that certainly this said uh, that sort of uh, the set of the case studies that we are experimenting that, you know, different approaches to try to understand what the project impacts are. And in fact, we, we have already shared this initiative with the GFSB coordination union. They're very appreciative and then they want to learn from what, what we've been doing. So we'll be on our watch too. So <laughs> I'm happy to continue working with you. Thank you very much said that your excellency is over okay with that let me officially close this session so that, that the people who are very very busy uh can run and uh also if, if you if you ran if you can stay on and emma if you can stay on a little bit can i continue on with a question and answer yes, and if I, for, can, for the I can stay yeah very, very good. Thank you so much for that. Though those, those of you who have to run, thank you very much for your participation. Um, Ren, do you want to share your screen? Because there was a request coming from the chat saying that uh, can you show you can, can you show us that the more magnified that the project the plots that the club uh, yield mapping. See what you have shown in that screen if you can do that that's going to be great and also sure. while we wait for that emma if i may ask um your crop modeling estimation with the remote sensing data sets it's sort of like a, the be better fit of the actual sort of crop yield estimation um this can this can be done in cambodia in a sort of like a relatively efficient timeline like for example for the pro is anybody using this this uh, result for the project monitoring purposes or uh, any other purpose in Cambodia your data that you presented I understand that the very limited time was time uh, for the preparation was given so you might not get the latest data but for example 2021 say in Cambodia right now it's in a lockdown you can't really go out and collect the data but based on the remote sensing data with the machine uh, sorry the crop modeling can you come up with this a very good result of what the what what is happening in the rice field is that the case are you still so there Emma? Yes, I am. Uh, so I thank am. you, thank yeah. you, thank you. Okay, so at the moment we have this small project still in Cambodia. It's called the Rice Phase Three. It's a small okay. uh, province uh, project. We are mm. monitoring four four provinces, wherein this is. A, uh, I'm not, I'm not very sure whether all of them are sample for dry run in the crop insurance, and um, uh, we are um, monitoring and then uh, generating some rice data, the rice area, the SOS, the yield estimates, and some of these informations are provided, as far as I know, provided to the crop insurance, um, um, crop insurance um, people for for their use. Um, I see. I, I just don't know the extent uh, when it comes to the crop insurance. As to, I have very minimal. Um, um, knowledge on that one, but at least I know that the data generated are being provided to them. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. And in that, in the estimation of the crop yield is not really, is it based on the individual plots? No, oh. it's a special one. It's a special right, one. Right, right. But yeah. if, we, if, we, if we lay over the individual cropping map, if that uh, your observation area and our project area interacts, and then we can put the layer on it and it can, it, can we estimate that 
heels. It could that be way. because the I, I think so because the one thing I could see is you have the actual yield data coming from the farmer at least for mm -hmm. a specific field. And mm -hmm. once we ever lay a overlay that with the results that we have which is a raster uh, map or uh, anything we could uh, at least um, generate the comparison between the yield estimates of the two um, for that particular field mm. that is being done mm. it's only yeah depending on what location so far our uh, monitoring locations is Prebang, Takiao, uh, Batambang I forgot the other one. <laughs> yeah. So Batamban and Preben is a, okay. Canton Tong? Yeah. Uh, no. no, 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 no. Wow. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, uh, yeah, but there is another one. Uh, okay. For that. Okay. Well, we can find so out that, about that's it. How, that's <laughs> how I see it. The, uh, how, how, how could we um, at least um, compare the results that we have, the, the, your, your result as well, and see how it goes. Interesting. So thank you, thank you, Emma. Um, um, Ren, do you want to come in? Sorry, but, but can you show us the map again? Sorry. Sure. There are a lot of people who hasn't seen this yet. Oh, um, let me share my screen again. There you go. Uh, right, so there was a question earlier if we can check um, the actual and predicted yield for individual plots. So for this, I would recommend going to... Um, either these two view types. So the first one is survey results um, round through. So what this shows you are the plots um, colored based on the actual yield of the plots. And this one um, are the same plots, but colored based on our predictions. Uh, so either select um, one of these um, two views and then you can actually click on the specific plot and this will show you um, a tooltip which shows you the um, exact number of um, the survey yield for this particular plot and our um, yield estimate. So yeah, so you can do that for. Uh, um, you want to show that the gender thing, right? See how what you can show. So we also have a view um, that shows you the plots based on um, the gender of the household um, head. So here, um, the blue shows plots that are headed by male and um, yellow are um, house, um, plots that are headed by um, female households, uh, females. So here, um, you can also see that information in the tooltip. So there's a line here um, specifying the gender of the um, household head. So, so orange one is the women, right? And what yes. happens if you click the dry season? Some of them becomes like colorless. Am I correct? Ah, uh, no, not yeah, really so, here. Okay. Um, yeah. So for um for the view that shows the gender, um, that won't be um applicable. But if you click on the first three view types, um, it will show a grayed out uh a grayed out plot and that would indicate that um, there was no survey result available for this um, particular plot um, during that season because as actually we, um, okay so we we discussed this earlier about this the project office and that could mean that people chose not to cultivate this land for the dry right. season yes. for the whatever the reason right exactly so, yep so that's the sort of like a one discussion point that we like to bring for the focus discussion with the women groups. Thank, thank you. Um, Viranchi, do you want to point out some of the things you want to see? By the way, this blue lines are main canals. Yes. Right? So, yeah. So we also overlaid um, the canal system data that you shared with us. Um, we also color coded it. Uh, based if it's a large, small, or other type of canal, as you can see um, in the legend here on the left. Okay, thank you. Um, I think all many interesting questions are already answered in the chat box. And as Sharini's one is that the things that we were discussing earlier, uh, when we, when it, comes to the machine learning, <laughs> we, we gave them the 390 data points only. It's not, it's hardly a big data. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, and then in the discussion, if we wanted to just do the uh, in 
prove the accuracy in an estimation and, and then, then the, what is the minimum, bare minimum data points that they want to see? And then your answer is? Brand? Oh, right. So um, based on the estimates of um, the more senior MLRs in at the office, so they said that it might help to bump up the results if we had at least 1,000 data points. And uh, 1,000 so, yeah. would make a difference, but the RAM was mentioning about something like 100,000 or something. <laughs> I was thinking, well, that's going to cost us a lot. <laughs> Anyways, um, I, this this kind of things, are practical things, is really useful discussion moving forward. And yeah. then also the Will's uh, point of this, uh, it was really interesting to see that if it, the individual plot something that is not really hard, available, readily available in any of those developing member countries that are that I I'm aware of, and then the, to plot this individual uh, cultivation areas, it's going to take decades <laughs> for, if you do it that uh, just uh, you know hire somebody to do this. But as an AI could do a good job, and then the, I think Will, you mentioned that the, you you're already working on this Nigeria. Have you done the similar work in Nepal as well? Yeah. So. And um, as I was showing in the, in the presentation, in Nepal, we had been mapping uh, croplands and uh, houses, roads, and also doing ground surveys to figure out where are the uh, agro dealers, superimposing all of this information to try to help people then optimally place new agricultural resources. So if you want to place a, a new agro dealer or a fertilizer warehouse, where, where, where would be the ideal place? And um, all of that kind of information can help people make these kinds of decisions. Right. It, and then that, that has been done already in, at the national scale? Uh, yes. Nepal? Oh, yes. wow. Yes. OK. Who is going to propose something? Because my colleague started doing something new in Nepal. And then there was just a study pondering about what needs to be done. But anyhow, um, maybe that's a separate discussion of follow-on work. If there's anything, that I'll, I'll, I can share that with you. And also, I can share that information with my colleagues as well. Um, there's some other information popping up, the questions popping up. Um, uh, they, so just for the clarification, the crop types, we were not able to collect the, uh, the crop yield result by crop varieties. That's something that was not um, done in the crop survey. And uh, Leo, any chance we can download these data in Excel formats? I can share that the survey data but what about the estimation data ren do we have that for per plot estimated you you have it somewhere and in fact uh, yeah. do we have it too um yeah i can share it with you so um you can okay. share it with anyone who requests for me that's um, very ADD. good thank you and uh chantu Yes, uh, Michiko, I was thinking also that one of the important uh, initiative under RISE SDP is also the land preparation or land leveling. Uh, I'm not sure if we can incorporate some uh, information, you know, if uh, some kind of lands that have been uh, introduced and has uh, different results or not or something like that, that we can also uh, use for uh, our information also. And secondly, uh, I also just want to see the ownership uh, building or capacity uh, transferring, so capacity uh, transferring from the think uh, tank also to MAF. I, I see that MAF is also very uh, enthusiastic of uh, receiving uh, further capacity building and so that they can also use this kind of skills in the future for their institutions. And uh, thirdly, uh, under RICE SDP, we also provide a, a lot of support for different mapping, for example, like um, soil classification mappings, uh, eco, eco mappings and uh, uh, kind of different maps. I'm not sure if we can somehow um, 
uh, uh, integrate or combine. So I, I talk, I'm talking about the future when we also have extension of two more years and also to see if we can also uh, find if, uh, you know, these uh, rice mills and storage capacity and how this flow into uh, from this kind of uh, uh, farmers and if they have uh, used the local uh, the facility that introduced by the, the uh, projects, the program, and also to see if different uh, farmers of the access to or of the piloted farmers uh, use traditional or so it new seeds and reduced by the program. So this is from for me, uh, Michiko. Thank you. Thank you, Chen Tu. That's uh, the future uh, direction. Um, maybe that's a separate work that we can consider for the going going forward with this that uh, the rest of the rice SDP implementation. So with that, sorry, thank you very much for your active participation. I would like to let Will go back to sleep <laughs> because it's very, very weird timing for him. To, and anyway, thank you very much for your contribution. I would like to close this uh, session. Thanks for your participation.